Hi, this is Regina, Bill, and William. We're here with our pet talk. Uh, William is with Canis Fortis Dog Training, and uh, Bill and I are with San Saba County Friends of Animals. So we'll start with our pet fact of the week. And the pet fact is having more than one pet in your home can actually lead to a healthier and happier pets. Studies show that pets have, uh, that live in multi-pet households often have fewer stress levels compared to those living alone. This is because they have companionship and social interaction with other animals which can reduce feelings of loneliness and anxiety. So if you're looking for another pet, we can help you with that at San Saba County Friends of Animals. You can go to sansabaanimals.com. All right, well, this week we're going to be discussing uh, about introducing a new pet with your existing pets. This can be from your, your adopted a, a new pet or you're looking at fostering a pet, temporarily bringing a pet into your home. But, I mean, uh, there, this can be just a simple, easy process of doing or it can have some stress levels in doing it. And we're just going to talk to William about the best ways to set yourself up for success. I know that when my son went into the Marine Corps and I took his cat in, uh, I got a bunch of documents that said three or four weeks, do this, do this, do this. And I had 72 hours to figure out how to get it to work. So I had to fast track it. And it, it ended up working out just well. But um, anyway, so my first question to you, William, is uh, what specific factors should I consider when introducing a new cat or dog to my existing pets? Well, there are, um, there are a few factors to consider. I would say one of them would be your, um, you know, how much time you have to devote to the, Absolutely. you know, to, to actually managing the interactions, right? To actually uh, supervising and making sure that things don't go south too, too quickly. Like if, you know, if you have a really, you're working like 12 hour shifts and you know and then you get home and then you got to sleep and then your your wife or your you know whoever lives with you is also gone right away and you guys don't have time to uh to at least manage some of these interactions some of these introductions and that's a huge factor to consider now in your case with your son went to the marines um, you had you had the 72 hours to take it, mm -hmm. right? Because that's why you said I had like 72 hours to, to get this done. But at least you had the time to to manage the interaction, to make sure that everything went well. So let's say that would that would be one big factor. Another factor would be knowing your existing pet. So having a a pretty good understanding of what kind of animal you have. Like for example, if I have a, a dog that is very social, that just loves dogs in general, then I know that the, the possibility of this going pretty smooth is going to be pretty high. If the pet that I'm bringing in is also social, then I, again, I know that the probability of this going very smooth is also pretty high. It doesn't mean that we can't just, you know, it doesn't mean that we should just let them, you know, go at it and then leave, close the door and and cross our fingers, make sure that everything goes well. But these are things to consider. You know, what kind of dog do I have? What kind of dog am I bringing in? Right, I can understand. I mean, it's like, like in my case, when I had the 72 hours to deal with this, I mean, I literally, that was my only thing on my agenda that weekend, that long weekend was basically to make this a success, work this in, get it to work out, because I was going to work on Monday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, Next question, uh, can you provide advice on how to prepare my home uh, for the new addition to minimize the stress and conflicts? So one thing that I would say is if you're bringing in a new pet, whether you're adopting or fostering uh, or somehow acquiring you know, a dog mm -hmm. or, or a cat, whatever, one thing that is very important that a lot of people don't... Um, don't pay attention to is your routine with your dog. So I'll give you an example. A lot of people free feed their dogs, meaning they'll just have a bowl and they just have like a, you know, just food 24 seven, right? right? They'll have water 24 uh, seven. And then their pet will have access to a bone or, a, or something very valuable 24 seven. You know, a bunch of stuff because they have a single pet. So they'll go, here's the food. You can have it wherever, whenever you want, the water, the bone, all of that. Well, when you bring another animal into that routine, you're now changing 
that routine dramatically for your existing pet. So to you, it might not be a big deal. To you, it might just be, I'm just bringing in another pet. But to your dog, it can be a big deal. You know, again, looking back at what kind of dog do I have? But even in general, even if I have a very friendly dog, if he has his bowl, he has his bone, he has his water, he has his food, all of that, and I bring another dog in, and the dog is like, I'm in a new place, and look, there's free food 24 seven. Even if you give that dog his own food bowl, right? Even if you go, hey, you also get your own bone. A lot of times what people don't realize is when you put two animals that don't know each other, and sometimes even if they know each other, you put two animals in the same room and you put limited resources like food, bone, right? Something that is valuable. Even though to us it's not limited, we'll just put more food on there, right? To them, it's a limited resource and now you have two competing parties here. And this can be especially a problem if they don't know each other. So how would I prepare my environment for that? I would take care of that. So if, if there's constantly access to a bone, I would remove that. Just to be cautious, just to be sure that there are going to be no misunderstandings over that bone. Um, if there is free access to food 24-7, I would remove that. And then I put my dog on a bit of a schedule. This is to take the precaution to make sure that that is not a reason why they're not gonna get along. Um, because some dogs will be great, amazing, love people, love dogs, but the moment you put a limited resource and then you put competing parties there, then it, the, the story can change very quickly. Yeah, because I mean, like you said, the, the bone is singular, the bone is a prize. That's, that is what someone, a dog, an animal is used to having. You yes, bring sir. something in, it's protective, it goes, it's mine. I mean, yes, sir. My, my sick dog, he was a uh, rescue, he was on the streets for a while, mm -hmm. he developed food aggression, mm -hmm. and they told me when I adopted him, don't feed him around other dogs, we always put him in a crate, feed him by himself. And I still, to this day, you know, probably eight plus years later, when he eats, he constantly looks left, right, left, right. Yeah. yeah. And if a, a cat walks by, you just hear a little growl, don't come yeah. by me. He's not going to do anything, but don't come by me. Yeah, and your other animals probably understand that too. They go, all right, when he's eating, we'll just leave him alone. He's a pain in the butt, leave him alone. He's yeah. Crunchy. Well, yeah. as far as bones, you know, we have treats that we'll give our dogs. And we have two sisters, well, they're not actual sisters, but they were raised together. And um, they've always gotten along great. But mm -hmm. if you have a bone and one eats it faster than the other one, there's a problem. Yeah, you know, so, this is exactly um, it. And, and yeah. we just have to be careful of that kind of well, okay. as you pointed yeah. out, you, you, you know what an issue is. Don't leave it there to be an issue. Yes. Remove it. Yes. Control yes. it. Yep. Make, make it an enjoyable for everybody in the house. <laughs> yeah, you know, the other thing too is, and I'm sure some of this stuff we're going to discuss as, as we go down the list, but the, the biggest thing to me is if you can take the extra precaution, take it. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's better to go... Yeah, this is a little bit of extra precaution and might be an extra step, but I'll just go ahead and do it anyway. Because, yeah, gambling it can work. You know, like going, eh, maybe they'll be all right. Yeah, they might be all right, but if they're not, now you have a problem. Yeah, it's like when I go out to feed the animals at night. It's sometimes it's easy to leave the gate halfway open, but it's not really worth the time and effort <laughs> that it's going to take to get everybody out if they get in. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Now take the precaution. Definitely. Well, our next question is: What are some common signs of stress or aggression that we should watch for during the introduction process? Okay, so that's a really good one. So, I uh, so. yeah, it's a really, really good question. So when um, there's a couple of ways to introduce pets, there is a bit of the longer way, and then there is the let's cross our fingers and hope that it works out way. So the the first one, you basically um, go, you don't have to meet. That's the first way. It's like, you don't actually have to meet. You just have to coexist. You focus on someone else. You focus on someone else. Like maybe I'll put you in a crate, right? And I'll hang out with you. That way they're both getting exposure to each other. Then I'm going to put you in a crate. I'm going to take the other one out and I'm going to hang out with you. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is like, you know, 
you and somebody else, like you could get one of the dogs, handle one of the dogs, and like your wife can handle the other dog. And then you both go for a walk. That's another way to do it. So you're not actually, We've done that. they're not actually meeting. They're not actually going, hey, how are you? Who are you? Um, and so going back to your question, what are some of the common signs? Uh, the, one of the common signs is, usually happens if you do it the latter way, which is, let's kind of cross our fingers and hope, hope, you know, hope that it works out. That's when you're more likely to see some of these signs that I'm going to be discussing. So one of those signs is, like, constant focus on the other animal. Okay. If it's like an, an interrupted focus, meaning they're just locked in, even if they're not growling, even if the hackles are not up, even if there is no vocalization, the very fact that the dog will just not, will just not take a break, it'll just stay, like glare, and I'm not even taking a break, to me, that's a bit of a, a bit of a red flag. And it's not that this dog is having really bad intentions, but just the focus is just so intense. This dog is thinking, the moment I have the opportunity, I'm gonna immediately go and investigate. Well, that might be the case, but it also might be another case. It might be like, I'm immediately gonna go and I'm just gonna kick him in the shins. Or it might be like, I'm immediately gonna go and I'm just going to establish a uh, hierarchy. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And then the other dog might be like, you're not going to do that. And that kind of plants the seed for uh, misunderstandings and problems. So one of the signs to me is constant, like just staring, just frozen. The dog is frozen, just looking at the dog. That to me is a sign of potential, potential aggression that, that might happen. Another sign would be, obviously, you see... Um, Another sign like of stress would be this. If, and a lot of people don't, don't detect this. If it looks like they're getting along, there's a little, very subtle thing that you can, you can pay attention to. And basically what it is is this. A lot of people go, yeah, they're playing, they're having a good time. But pay attention to the two animals and go, are they both having fun? Or is just one of them having fun? And that's a very subtle thing that it gives you the illusion that, yeah, they're playing. They're just, you know, running around. They're kind of chasing each other. They're doing this and that. And you think, well, they're not fighting. They're not biting. So, therefore, they must be having fun because they're running. But if you look and actually look and go, who's doing most of the chasing? If they're taking turns, it's a good sign. But if they're not taking turns, and one of them is having a blast, like chasing, nipping, you know, like mm -hmm. playful nipping, right? Even if they look like they're just having fun, like they're just rolling, they're having a good time, and the other one is just like avoiding and, and kind of trying to create space and doing all of that, that alone, it looks harmless, but that is a sign of stress. And what a lot of people don't realize is because one of them is having fun, they immediately think they're both having fun, and that's not always the case. If it looks like they're both having fun, great. If they're both chasing, take, taking turns, that's great. If only one of them is doing it, the, the one who's not having fun is actually stressed. Okay, that's another sign. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we have some of the more obvious signs, like you'll have hackles up, uh, you'll have the dog kind of hiding, if the dog kind of goes under the bed, um, if the dog is uh, constantly, uh, just another sign is they just come to you immediately. So one of them comes to you and it's almost like they want to be next to you the entire time. Or like help me. Yeah, that's exactly what they're telling you. They could be telling you help me and what people don't, don't realize that they'll go, look, he's, he wants to play. And then they'll go, go ahead and play. But what happens is uh, we go back to that scenario the one is having a blast, the other one is going, this is too much for me. And then if, if they kind of hang out with you a lot, they're basically telling you that. They're telling you, please do something about this, <laughs> right? So that's a, a, a subtle sign of stress. Okay. Well, that's good things to Wait, I know we have a, a, a dog that's a little dog aggressive, but if you looked at her, you really couldn't tell that she didn't like other dogs until they're too close. Yeah. But if you look at her back, she's got really short hair, 
but it raises just a little bit. Yeah. So when her hair raises, we know she's you know yeah yeah she's absolutely. upset. Yeah. Well, we know to step into the situation. Absolutely. You know, step in, interrupt. Because it can go go south. So I've always heard introduce butt first. Is that something that you Oh, to heard? sniff? Mm -hmm. Like sniff each other's butts? And then yeah. that helps. It is definitely a much oh. better alternative than head to head. Mm -hmm. the, like if, if they're going to, if you're actually going to do it a little bit of the faster way, um, head to head, like nose to nose, if that's the first introduction. It's usually not ideal. Mm -hmm. Another one is if you're going to do that and then on top of that you have leashes and the leashes are tight, tight leashes create more intensity. Oh. So a, a tight leash automatically creates that feeling of, that sensation of agitation by default. So then you, you pair that up with nose to nose, that's where a lot of times the problems will happen. That makes sense. Are there any particular behaviors or body language cues that indicate the introduction is not, I mean, is going well? That is going well. It is going well. So when I see play bowing, have you, what would you say? play bowing. Okay. So have you seen dogs that you know uh, they just kind of do like almost like a, like the downward dog? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So if they do the play bowing, um, they're it's a very polite way of saying, "Hey, do you want to play?" And if the other dog does responds with a play bow, that's a good sign. That means they're going, "Yeah, let's play." If you see bouncing, that's a good sign. Um, if you see, like I mentioned earlier, taking turns, mm -hmm. that's a good sign. That means the one dog is going a little bit of chasing and then they'll go, all right, now it's your turn. Now you do a little bit of chasing. Those are all good signs. Um, if you don't see that, if you see like a lot of stiff, slow body language, that's the opposite of bouncy, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. Uh, but yeah, to me, that's a good sign if, if they're, uh, you know, they're, they're bouncy, play bowing. Um, if they're doing all of those things and they're, they're taking turns, they're, they look like they're talking to each other, meaning they're reciprocating, the other one's reciprocating the same type of body language, then that's usually a good sign. That tells me, okay, these guys are, are going to get along pretty good. Well, yeah, the uh, downward dog, the play bowing. Yes. I've seen that. Yeah. When they're get introduced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the bouncing. Yeah. We've the seen bouncing. The, I yeah. see the bouncing every time I walk in the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like I can walk out of a room and walk back in and I got one bouncing. It's like, dude, I just was right here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So how can we prevent or address potential conflicts between animals during the introduction phase? You've kind of talked about this a little bit, but just being, I guess, being how to how to reduce it at the very beginning instead of waiting for it yeah so how to prevent it how to reduce it um going back to a little bit of what i mentioned earlier look at the resources that and they're not resources to us they're resources to the animal look at the resources that the dog is fond of so if the dog really loves a particular bed like they absolutely love this particular bed um I would say for the time being, remove it. Okay. Just because if the other dog goes, hey, that bed looks really comfortable. Well, your dog might not be particularly willing to share right away with a dog that it barely knows. Or you know favorite I mean? toy. Or favorite toy. So it's kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, food, bones. Even if the, sometimes people go, well, no, no, no. Fido gets a bone, but the other dog that I'm getting will also get a bone. So they have two bones. Now they don't have to fight. They don't look at it that way. They go, there are two bones. <laughs> and there's just, you know, me. So sometimes those will do that. And dogs, it's, it's inherent for them to do that. Like all animals, it's actually not, this is going a little bit off topic, but it's actually normal for every animal you go to the zoo you you go and observe nature it is normal for every animal to want to maintain control of resources that's how animals thrive that's how they live that's that's how they do well if animals in their natural state were hey you can take whatever i have they just that that specimen would would 
wipe itself out of the gene pool. Do you see what I mean? Like it is yes. normal for every animal to go, this is my stuff, don't mess with it, right? So it is actually not normal when we see just excess cooperation. The reason we see that with our dogs is because there's a lot of breeding that has been taking place. There's a, a, a large history of symbiotic relationship between dogs and people. So dogs over a period of a, lot, a long time have learned to adapt to, you know, to, to these behaviors that would not normally be um, normal or acceptable in any other state. But it's still there. So the, the I don't want to share my, my things, it's actually not uncommon at all. A lot of dogs have it to a small degree. Some have it to a larger degree, as a lot of us know. So um, that would be the thing to set them up for success is find the things that they like. Even if you go, no, no, my dog will be fine just to be precaution, just to have the extra precaution, right? If you can take the extra precaution, take it and then just remove it at least for the time being. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. All right, completely off topic, looking out the window here, I just saw a bike go by with the dog pulling the bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just saw that too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, I'm not sure how that fits into <laughs> training with the leashes. But, uh, okay, so next question, what should we do if the introduction doesn't go as planned or if there are ongoing issues between the pets after they've been introduced? So that, that depends on what the issues are like little misunderstandings, not the end of the world. You know, they give each other feedback all the time. That's what dogs do. You know, sometimes we'll raise our voice to one another, right? We'll clarify. Sometimes my wife and I miscommunicate and sometimes she'll like, you know, go, hey, I need you to do this and this. I'm like, I'm in the middle of doing something else right now, right? So. We have like these little discussions and sometimes we have these little disagreements like every human being does. Well, dogs do the same thing. They just do it in their language. So what they'll do is they'll sometimes do a little snap. Sometimes they'll do a little vocalization like your dog does. Right when it's eating and another animal gets a little bit too close, he'll vocalize. He's basically letting them know, I'm eating, don't interrupt me, right? So little things like that, like a quick snap, um, you know, like some vocalization, probably not the end of the world, but if it is consistent, if it's consistent, that's the problem, right? So to me, if, if, um, if it's also, if it doesn't make sense, it's also a problem. What I mean by that is your dog vocalizes, your specific example, your dog vocalizes when another dog walks nearby while it's eating, correct? Yes. So let's say if we remove the food and he, constantly growl while other dogs walk by whether he's eating or not wouldn't matter now you have a pattern now there's a bit of a problem there do you see what i mean yes so that's when i'll look at that and i'll go okay this is probably not going well i need to start taking some precautions the other thing that could happen is the more obvious which is the one dog is basically nailing the other or they're just they just don't even want to be in the same room they just go I really don't like you being here. I don't like the space. I don't like sharing the space with you, right? Whatever the case might be. So if we see those things, that tells us, okay, this is not going well. So what do we do there? Let's go back to ground zero. We go back to the drawing board. We act as though we're introducing them again for the very first time, which is what I mentioned earlier. The long way to do it, if you can, is... You don't have to interact with each other, you just have to coexist. You go in the crate, I'll hang out with you. Then you go in the crate, I'm gonna take the other one out, we're gonna hang out. If you know your wife, sister, roommate, whatever, can take one dog for a walk, and then you take the other dog for a walk, then you bas basically walk together. That's another way to slowly reintroduce. It's like you're, you're hitting the reset button and going, this did not go well, let's start over. Rather than going, hey, why are you mad at him? I'm just going, no, 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 this is not going well. Let's start over. And, and then that, that alone might be, you know, might be enough. You're basically re-establishing the relationship from the bottom, from the beginning. Um, and then depending on how severe the case is, you might need a little bit of extra help, or you might be able to do it yourself, not a problem at all. Okay. So do you train 
um, at your training facility, do you train pairs of dogs? So like if somebody brought you a pair? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm getting along. I've had a bunch of those cases where uh, one dog is biting the other dogs. I had one case where one of my clients had, I mean, she called me crying. She was like, I'm going to have to put this dog down. Her dog was injuring the other dog just injuring it uh had to get stitches and it was a dog that it loved like she loved the dog that was doing the damage and she was like he's great otherwise it's just they're just now not getting along and it's injuring the other dog uh so we worked together and we basically taught the dog uh a much more structured version of what i just mentioned earlier which is coexist we taught that dog Look, you don't have to necessarily love that dog, but you're going to leave it alone. You're not going to do these things. And we're also going to protect you from the other dog. Meaning, I know the other dog's not being aggressive, but even if the other dog is like curious and wants to check you out, we know you like your space, so we're going to protect your space. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep the other one at bay also. Even though he's not being aggressive, he's just being friendly. He wants to approach, go, hey, what's going on? I know you don't like that, and I know you like your space, so we're going to protect your space. So just like we're protecting the other dog from you, we're going to protect you from the other dog. And then we did that over and over and over, and then they eventually became friends again. That's awesome. You know, it's just restructuring I know that. We, we have our two females that I mentioned earlier, and I know their hormones are changing, just, yeah. just like older women, mm -hmm. their, their hormones are changing. So they went from getting along, they're, they're starting to have a few problems. Yeah. And I mean, we're working through it, but they never did that before. And yeah. upon reading and researching it, it appears to be how old are they? Change at uh, nine. Okay, so the thing, another another thing, this happens to males too. So all dogs go through maturity stages. They're puppies, young adults, adults, and then they're senior dogs. Between uh, young adult to adult, you're going to see major changes. Mm -hmm. If they didn't like dogs before they might be okay with dogs and when they switch into adulthood if they like dogs before as young adults when they switch into adulthood you might realize suddenly they don't like dogs mm -hmm. and then you'll realize in their adult life which their adult life will last several years will typically last from about two and a half to about seven eight nine years of age that's their adulthood right uh, then from roughly seven to nine years of, of age and beyond now senior that's a senior stage and a lot of times you'll have a dog that is a certain way for their adult life and they're a, a very particular way and then when they cross that line into senior stage mm -hmm. they'll act different than they did before suddenly they can become less tolerant of a bunch of different things so that's Changes like that are to be expected when they go from young adult to adult and from adult to senior. That makes so much sense because my dog, particularly Amber, I fostered. Um, I had dogs in and out of my house. I was constantly fostering different dogs. She came in, she was a foster failure, mm. and she tolerated all the other dogs, no problems at all. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden she became dog aggressive as she, it was probably around a, close to the two. Yeah. So she became dog aggressive and now she's changed again to where her sister that she got along with she's starting to have problems with so that makes a lot of sense yeah well ollie's 12 years old and he's at the point now when it's time for him to go to bed which is like 7 45 8 he goes into a corner and he lays down and anything that goes near him it's just like a, a growl or something. yeah he just that's more of a growl it's just a little like growl it's like just it's he's, he's giving man. feedback yeah he's like we call him the gr yeah it's regina said the grumpy old man so yeah. Right. yeah yeah that's senior that's the senior stages yeah, yeah very common we have all four senior dogs yeah. So uh, that's it. that's very interesting feedback you gave us there. Um, so last question here: How important is it to consider the individual personalities and temperaments of both the new pet and the existing pets? It's probably uh, one of the top considerations to look at the temperament of the dog. You know, be probably the first. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, uh, definitely up there because you have to look at the. Uh, It'll tell you how difficult this is going to be. It'll tell you how easy it's going to be. Okay. You know, if, if I have, I know there are dogs that I know that if I were to go, we're going to introduce this dog to another dog and they're going to come into the same, they're going to live in the same household. I know based on my knowledge of the dog, of the individual, the individuals that I'm thinking, I would go, this is going to be a long journey <laughs> because one mishap, one little thing, 
somebody's getting nailed and it's probably gonna include me as well when I try to break them apart so um, and then I have dogs that I know that I'm like oh I could just bring a dog in and then in half an hour they'll be best friends I know when I look at doing some of the introductions I look at I want to do this where it doesn't involve a, a vet visit yes I, I just no vet visits no no trips to the hospital for you to get to, yeah. to get stitches none of that I've had that with a foster dog attacking one of my dogs so yes been there done that yeah. so what about cats I mean how do you introduce a dog to a cat the, so cats are not my area of expertise but I do have okay. a cat okay okay and I've done a lot of introductions with you know with dogs client dogs personal dogs to cats a lot of it is the temperament of the cat as well some some cats are very bold um, fearless right those I'll keep them at bay because they'll just go right up to the dog they'll start sniffing if the dog goes well who are you and they'll swipe the dog have one of those. <laughs> so if I'm bringing a dog into that into that environment with a cat that is very bold like that I'm gonna same thing I, I want the dog to feel safe so I'm gonna keep the dog at bay if, I'm sorry the cat at bay if I have to keep that cat like within arm's distance I'm like hey I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you away from this dog. If the dog is, on the other hand, like I mentioned earlier, if the dog is locked in, really take my time there. Like if the dog especially looks at the cat, it doesn't even blink, it's just frozen, and he kind of follows the cat, to me that's a big red flag. Yeah. Um, so that's when I'll take extra precautions there. So when I had to do the introduction with my dog and cat, I had my dog boarded while I went and got the cat mm -hmm. and so I brought the cat home that first night and it was just the two of us and it's nice got it set up in its little environment but when I went to get my dog I put the cat in a big bathroom had the doors closed yeah I brought my dog in I took him toward the door and didn't bring attention to the door but then he started smelling and I could see the cat had worked its way and it smelled and I let that go for half a day yeah just yeah. to kind of get the smells going and it helped i think it helps a that with the that is a great way to introduce cats in general you know like when uh when we've introduced our older cat that passed away now to the cat that we have that's exactly how we did it through the door sniffed each other to the bottom uh and then just basically had them get to know each other you know through just that little crack mm -hmm. and then afterwards we're fine so for cats i know that's a great strategy i uh, probably four or five days after that whole ordeal I, I the my dog and the cat were sitting next to each other on the couch and I took a picture of it and sent it to it's the lady that was fostering him when I got him and sent that picture to her and she responded back I thought I would never see that yeah <laughs> ever see that dog interact with a cat but it can happen yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so three advantages that I found online of, of owning multi pet uh, having multi pets in your home is social learning um, engaging where they, they can learn tricks faster and, and different habits, um, improved immunity, uh, exposure to a variety of pet dander, and it can, it can just help strengthen their immune system for both pets and humans, risk, taking away the risk of allergies and autoimmune disorders. It can reduce boredom. Um, they're less likely to be bored, which can help with destructive behaviors and, and loneliness and all of that. So that's, one advantage and that, that is another thing if you want to reach out to William I'll let him give you his contact but um, he has been working with our deaf dog Spud who is available for adoption and um, he's been doing a wonderful job and he's donating his time to do that and we highly recommend him so what how can they reach you yeah so if uh, if you guys go to Canis I'm gonna spell it C-A-N-I-S-F-O-R-T-I-S dot uh, net you can fill out the form get in touch with me and um, the other website is dog training is my passion so if you go to dog training is my passion altogether dot com that will also bring you to, uh, to a website where you can get in touch with me and we thank you also for being a part of the radio show every Wednesday every Wednesday you can thank listen you. in and, and hear his expertise because uh, he's a, a man of knowledge I will tell you yeah, that. and just to get to give William a shout out on this part I mean he has I don't know how many videos free mm. of helpful information on his YouTube page I go through him I 
find, I, I can find almost any topic in there I'm looking for, yeah. <laughs> and they're they're quite knowledgeable. I mean, I mean, they're, I I follow them, and there's there's good information coming from it. So I mean, and biz, biz he writes of, books, and we've yeah. bought all three of them. Four. I appreciate four? that. Oh, it's four. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, he, he's an author. Uh, you can get his books on Amazon. And additionally, you can go visit his YouTube page, and he's got a, what was it, hundreds or thousands? Thou over a thousand. Over a thousand. Over a thousand, yeah. thousand videos on there, uh, free videos to watch. And yeah. some of them are 20, 30 minutes long going into it. They're not just two, three minute little segments on. Yeah. For more information, call me. No, it's actually, he goes into yeah. helpful information on it. So, I mean, that's a wealth of free knowledge available. But again, we'll, uh, we'll be on next Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great day.